So thanks everybody for this week, um, Let's talk about privacy. Let's talk about security. Uh, I had a really terrific team of computer scientists, legal scholars, economists, um, psychologists helping us uh, to produce. So this is very much a collective effort. I also want to say it's very much a first draft. So our draft will not go live at the end of at the end of the panel. We think of this very much an opportunity to get uh, feedback from all of you and then revise so that we can put the final draft uh, and share it with the world in uh, toward the end of June. Um, all right, so I don't know that I need to belabor the point. We had a really terrific set of conversations yesterday and last night about some of the privacy challenges that the world faces today. Um, we haven't talked much about data breaches, but the, uh, the trend lines on data breaches suggest uh, very significant increases even, the, uh, even over the last decade, and the scope of the data breaches just gets larger and larger. Beyond that, when we and our committee thought about the challenges of privacy, uh, we thought that oftentimes um, the default terms, either offered by law or by a platform or an app, were ones that uh, were likely to be uh, fairly broad deals for consumers. And that as a result of the way that people are inter interacting with platforms and with apps, they're often making what the legal system deems choices that don't actually reflect their own preferences, expectations, etc. cetera. Uh, moreover, I think a particularly big problem here and a real reason why some of the traditional approaches to privacy regulation have not worked is they simply demand too much of consumers who are not experts um, and have a lot of other things to worry about uh, but are frequently asked to make decisions about highly technical matters. Um, this will sort of pick up on the screen from yesterday. While we think that market competition can be a healthy force in privacy and security, we don't think it's anywhere near a solution, and some of the reasons why involve the very significant externalities associated with privacy. Uh, if, um, to use one example, if a relative of mine decides to share their uh, genetic information with 23andMe, uh, they've not only disclosed their information, they've disclosed my information, uh, all of my descendants' information, and uh, uh, many times, as we'll talk about a little, as we get a little bit later, if there's a data breach at one company, that will create all kinds of problems for other companies and other consumers. Um, uh, if you think about sort of a consumer taking matters into their own hands and trying to punish a company over bad data or security practices, that works really nicely, maybe, with uh, consumer-facing companies. But a lot of the most powerful companies in this space are, let's say, data brokers who don't have any direct relationship with consumers, and therefore the question is if a consumer wanted to take their business elsewhere, do they have any effective way of doing that? And in the data security space, there's a lot of uh, reasons why market competition uh, is helpful but inadequate, and one of these is simply that uh, this is a highly technical subject matter. Firms that are at the cutting edge of data security have some incentive not to actually broadcast what they're doing because there's no way to meaningfully convey that information to consumers without conveying the same information to hostile actors. So what we're trying to do here is not replicate GDPR, replicate the recent California legislation. We're not trying to provide a comprehensive privacy bill of rights or anything like that. Instead, what we're trying to do are identify three big problems in privacy and security and offer what we think of as helpful and uh, novel solutions to those problems. Um, having said that, What's going on in the rest of the world is part of why we're doing what we're doing and why we believe there's some urgency to it. So the United States is becoming increasingly out of step with mo what most of the industrialized world is doing on privacy, um, setting aside China. Uh, and um, the, the real challenges from the perspective of looking forward five or 10 years is we've already seen at least uh, the European courts once hold that the United States data protection regime was inadequate. Wouldn't it all surprise us if that happened again in fairly short order? And so if there's not greater harmonization between what's happening in the US and what's happening with our primary trading partners, then there's a real risk of uh, shutting down the transatlantic and trans-Pacific uh, flow of data. Um, having said that, uh, I think uh, some members of the committee are uh, worried about aspects of the GDPR um, with one respect, whether it translates well into the American legal system how much discretion it gives, how much vagueness is embedded in GDPR, uh, et cetera. Okay, so uh, the first issue I want to talk about, and actually the issue I'll spend the most time talking about, are dark patterns. And uh, 
Uh, Luigi uh, uh, and Chris talked a little bit about that uh, at dinner last night. Uh, it's a phrase that some of you know, if you come from a computer science tradition, you've probably heard a lot about dark patterns. If not, I promise you, you've seen dark patterns before, and what I'll do is just give you a vocabulary to describe what you've seen uh, before. So I've thrown a definition up on the slide, um, but what we're basically talking about are user interfaces that are designed to confuse users, uh, make it difficult for them to express their actual preferences, or manipulating them into taking an action that they prefer not to take. And we're at the University of Chicago Business School, so an important nod uh, should go in the direction of Dick Thaler and also his co-author, Kat Sunstein, who developed a really you know, wonderful set of ideas called nudges. And I think what Thaler would say about dark patterns is they're a form of sludge or a nudge uh, for, uh, for evil. Um, and they tend to, these dark patterns are going to tend to uh, discourage system two decision making, deliberative decision making, and encourage more impulsive uh, system one decision making. All right, so what I'm going to show you are a couple of examples of dark patterns in the wild. If you're interested, there's a couple of websites that aggregate all kinds of dark patterns. This is an example of a confusion strategy, and I don't think I need to explain why it's confusing. Uh, if, you look at the, if you look at the graphic, it'll become quite apparent that you're likely to leave consumers, especially if they're somewhat pressed for time, making the wrong selection, the one that doesn't reflect their values. Uh, here's another example of a dark pattern. This is, well, I'd like to unsubscribe from all the emails you're sending me. And the company says, sure, no problem. Uh, here's 48 checkboxes. I think 42 are on the slides, excuse me. Here's 42 checkboxes. We're not going to create a button that you can press to say unsubscribe from all emails. So if you'd like to stop getting all emails from us, you're merely going to need to uncheck these 42 boxes in order to proceed. Um, all right. This will seem like a little bit of a digression, but I, prob I promise it's not. It's a really lovely day in Chicago. The conference will end uh, this evening. What should you do? Well, one thing you might find very appealing is you can scroll down to our lakefront and check out a wonderful exhibition about the life of Alexander Hamilton with narrative by Lynn manuel Miranda. So this is one of the good tourist attractions in Chicago right now. Why, are, why am I talking about this? Well, last weekend I bought tickets for my family to go uh, attend the uh, Lin-Manuel uh, branded Hamilton exhibition. And I want to walk you through uh, what it was like to buy those tickets from Ticketmaster. So initially, they're not putting up much friction in the transaction. But as you get to the end of the transaction, you'll encounter a very classic dark pattern, which is an effort to sell you ticket insurance. You'll see this anytime you ever book a, a flight or anything like that. So the two options here are uh, yes, I want insurance or no, I don't want uh, ticket insurance in case I'm unable to attend for some reason. But let's look at how the choices are structured. Yes is in green. Uh, OK, that seems to be doing something. Um, but if you uh, select the top option, you're told, uh, yeah, I'd like to protect my ticket purchase. And then in bold letters, highly recommended. OK, that's important. So highly recommended by whom? Well, by Ticketmaster. But it turns out that this might actually have an effect on people, and we'll show you some data on that. You're also reminded that there's peer pressure here. Another Ticketmaster customer just protected their purchase a minute ago. And if you go down and select no, you'll be told actually 93,829 people protected their purchases in the last seven days with a quote from Tanya H. in Alpharetta, Georgia, will never purchase tickets without it again. All right, so if you understand the psychology of here, you clearly uh, recognize that this is not a choice about which Ticketmaster is neutral. OK, I rejected the insurance. I made it to this screen. OK, you bought the tickets. Hey, uh, we'd like to share your information with um, uh, an outside vendor. Uh, in this case, let's please give us permission to sign you up for 30 days of Hulu. And look at the graphic interface. Yes, please is in blue, bright letters. No thanks is in gray letters. That may make a difference. No, I don't want Hulu. Uh, OK, how about a subscription to a razor company? Uh, we'll sign you up for that. You can redeem it. No, I, I don't want razors. Um, Hotels.com, can we interest it? These were all in sequence. I'm not making this up. I don't want Hotels.com. Uh, well, what about Priceline? Well, Priceline's really similar to Hotels.com. If I wanted one, I would have wanted the other. And finally, after saying no to all four of these prompts, to share my information and sign me up for something that I really didn't want and it didn't germane to purchasing tickets through Ticketmaster, I'm finally done. And I'm told by Ticketmaster, OK, you can now go to the Ticketmaster app 
and access the electronic uh, ticket, which you will then scan when you try to get in the show. So I do that, and I'm then greeted with a pop-up ad that says, we'd really like to send you push notifications. Would you like push notifications? And there are two options, yes or maybe later. <laughs> so what's the missing option there, and why isn't it available? Uh, okay, so uh, this is sort of the setup for when our committee convened, I think um, a number of the committee members, uh, uh, Paul Loam, Jonathan Mazur, uh, Blaze Orr, were really just um, concerned about dark patterns. And I think what we very quickly identified was that this was not only a privacy problem, a contracting problem in general, but a particular privacy problem that the scholarly community just didn't know nearly enough about. So what we decided to do, um, and I was assisted uh, in this effort by a fantastic uh, PhD psychologist who's about to earn her JD at the University of Chicago, Jamie Liguri, who's here. Uh, what we wanted to do was supplement the existing literature and actually try to test some of, our, some of these dark patterns on a census-weighted representative sample of US adults and figure out uh, how much of a difference they make. Uh, we're gonna be publishing in a much lengthier academic paper a version of the data plus a lot more uh, over the summer and that'll be called uh, Shining a Light on Dark Patterns. All right, so this is what we did. What we essentially um, uh, did is we started out consu uh, confusing consumers as to what we were really after. We spent about, uh, we had, had consumers, they were compensated for their time, spent about 10 minutes giving us a whole bunch of information about their demographics, who they were, and then also what their expectations and beliefs were about a variety of different uh, privacy problems. And after collecting all this data, we showed them a screen that said, we're now calculating your privacy propensity score. And it turns out that everyone who took our survey, by design, was told, oh, turns out you care a lot about your privacy. Good news, uh, we've uh, signed you up with our corporate partners to receive a data protection plan that'll guard you against identity theft and allow you to monitor your credit uh, more easily. This was a ruse. We hadn't actually analyzed their privacy propensity scores at all. We also told them that analyzing all the demographic data that they'd given us, as well as using their IP address, we were able to um, identify their mailing address so as to make it more plausible that they had, in fact, been signed up for this thing. Uh, and we also randomly varied whether the what the cost was gonna be. Everyone was told that the first six months were going to be free, like the Hulu offer that Ticketmaster showed you. But half the respondents were told that after six months, the monthly charge would be $2.99, and half were told it was gonna be triple that, $8.99. Then we randomly assigned our subjects to one of three conditions, a control group that was gonna have an easy yes-no decision, a group that was gonna be exposed to mild dark patterns, and another third was gonna be exposed to aggressive dark patterns. So the control group is sort of a fairly neutral framework. We said, we've just signed you up for this. Do you want it or not? And if they declined it, then they were basically done with this part of the survey, and then we were gonna go ask some more questions, uh, make sure that they were spending about as much time on the survey as the people in the other conditions were. All right, what did the mild dark pattern condition look like? Well, we made it a little bit harder for people. All right, so what we did is we asked at the first, in the first instance, do you wish to accept or decline the data protection plan? And we used that tool, one you've seen before, of making the company's preferred option be the recommended choice. And we had the box be pre-selected so that if someone simply clicked next, then they will have accepted the data protection plan. Uh, no is not an option, but other options was an option. And for those people in the mild dark patterns condition, if they selected, my, if they selected other options, then they were gonna see one more screen one that required them to either say, I do not want to protect my data or credit history, which is a little bit psychologically loaded by design, or second, after reviewing my options on second thought, yeah, go ahead and uh, sign me up. For the people in the mild condition, there was one more screen where we just asked them to tell us why they declined the protection, but it turns out that didn't uh, do very much in convincing people who were otherwise inclined to say no to say yes. All right, what about the aggressive dark pattern condition, the third of the sample that saw this? Uh, same first two screens as the ones I just described in the mild, pa in the mild dark pattern condition, but uh, they're gonna see some additional screens as well, okay? So if they s said no on the first two screens, then we were gonna show them up to three additional screens where we were gonna give them uh, about a paragraph of text about identity theft, 
how bad it is, how frequently, occur, how frequently it occurs, what happens if it does occur. And at the bottom of each of those screens, there was a countdown timer that required them to stay on the screen for 10 seconds before they could advance to the next one. And there were two options, one that said, accept the data protection plan and continue. The other says, I would like to read more information. Because after all, everyone would like to read more <laughs> information. Uh, in, so in order to decline, they needed to make it through these three additional screens. And then in the aggressive dark pattern condition, they were going to see one more. And I think we're basically describing what Ticketmaster did. Um, uh, then uh, on this final screen, uh, we again use some of the sort of psychological pleading tactics. Well, we won't be able to protect you if you say no. You might be victimized if you say no. We're trying to implicate um, feelings of regret. And then, we say, and then we say, are you sure you want to decline this free identity theft protection? No, cancel, or yes. And the thought is that some people are going to say no, cancel, thinking that they'll say that they're declining the plan. But in fact, if they do that, literally, they'd be accepting the plan. Um, OK. Regardless of which condition you were in, you saw the same final screens where we're going to ask you questions like, how free did you feel to decline the data protection plan? Um, would you be interested in doing follow-up research by the same researchers? Uh, please describe your mood uh, between extremely annoyed and extremely happy. And then do you have any questions or comments about the survey? All right. So were these things effective? Yes, they were really effective. Uh, at least, uh, I don't know what your priors were. Uh, I was surprised by the magnitude of the effects. So really, there's two columns here. There's a sort of statistical question. As I'll, as I'll talk about in a little bit, we did, especially in the aggressive dark patterns condition, have a lot of people drop out of the study during those screens where we made them see a whole bunch of data and then wait for 10 seconds. So if you want to treat those people as trying to decline the uh, data protection plan, you're interested in the third column, adjusted acceptance rate. If you want to just focus on those people who made it all the way th through and treat people who dropped out as neither accepting nor declining, then you're going to be interested in the acceptance rate. But either way you cut it, we've got mild dark patterns more than doubling the acceptance rate and aggressive dark patterns more than tripling the acceptance rate just based on the choice architecture that we employed in trying to elicit their preference. Now, because of the way that Jamie set up the experiment, we're able to figure out precisely which of these dark patterns were most effective. And it turns out that across all conditions, it's that first screen, OK? Not a decision between yes or no, but a decision between yes and something else, and putting either recommended or highly recommended in the frame so as to indicate to consumers that that's what they're supposed to do. In the mild dark pattern condition, that accounted, just that first screen accounted for uh, three quarters of the acceptances. In the aggressive dark pattern condition, where after all, people had more opportunities to, to accept, it accounted for almost two thirds of the acceptances. Giving people a second chance also proved pretty effective at swaying people away from uh, declining the, the protection. Uh, and then as we go through the additional screens that only the aggressive dark pattern people saw, <laughs> If you combine the three screens with lots of text and the annoying countdown timer, that accounted for a little under 20% of the acceptances. And then the very confusing yes, cancel screen at the end accounted for a little bit more than 10% of the acceptances in that sample. OK, another thing that we're really interested in having discovered that these dark patterns are quite effective at bending a significant number of consumers to the company's will was who's falling for this. Uh, and so because we had collected a lot of demographic information, we were able to uh, make some progress on that question. And going into the project, our strongest prediction was about education levels. And that hypothesis, which was that less educated Americans would be more likely uh, to have their choices manipulated by dark patterns, was borne out by the data. So in the easy condition, no dark pattern, uh, there's no correlation between education and how willing people were to accept the plan. But as soon as we get to the dark patterns conditions, edu uh, less educated people are much more likely to accept the plan. So uh, you see on the slide um, that in the dark patterns conditions, uh, you can simply compare uh, people on the one hand who never attended college, so high school education and below, with people who um, graduated college or uh, finished a graduate degree. And you're seeing very significant uh, differences. Uh, in the mild condition, it's 34% of the less educated sample versus 21% of the highly educated sample. Uh, the, the magnitude of the effect's a little smaller, uh, but still sizable in the hard, dark pattern condition. 
And then once we controlled for um, income and other demographic factors, the statistically significant differences on education went away in the hard dark pattern condition, but not in the mild dark pattern condition. And I want to talk about that a little bit later. Now, one thing you might think is, gee, uh, Lior, when Ticketmaster made you click through all those screens, they probably ticked you off. And the truth is that they did, and that might, might make me marginally less willing to use Ticketmaster to buy tickets going forward, although it's Ticketmaster, so I won't really have a choice if I want to see a particular show. Um, so one of the things we were really interested in getting at is trying to figure out whether um, uh, people were really annoyed by the dark patterns, and if so, uh, which ones. And so one of the things I mentioned earlier is that user engagement is likely to suffer from the use of aggressive dark patterns. Uh, we randomly assigned people, but the dropout rate among people who saw aggressive dark patterns was hugely higher than the dropout rate among those who saw only the mild uh, dark pattern. Uh, when we asked people about their moods, what was interesting was that people who signed up for the data protection plan, regardless of whether they saw the straightforward, easy, yes, no, or a dark pattern, they were all uh, statistically uh, comparable to one another. There were no significant differences. But among people who wound up declining the plan, the people who were in the aggressive dark pattern condition were really, really angry, at least on the seven-point Likert scale. Uh, and the people in the mild dark pattern plan who wound up rejecting it were not significantly angry. Uh, there were not differences that were significant between them and the, dark, and the, and the control group at least across, uh, I think, three out of the four specifications that we used. This shows up in the qualitative data as well. Remember, we asked an open-ended question, can you tell us anything about the experiment? And the aggressive dark pattern people gave us a whole bunch of expletives. Uh, the mild dark pattern people, by and large, uh, did not. Now, um, we're sort of academic researchers creating a simulated environment. We're not a platform that has uh, lots and lots of market power. We have no market power whatsoever. Um, and so, you know, my sense is, uh, and there's some reason to, to believe that among the digital platforms that are employing these techniques, that um, uh, the ability of consumers to retaliate uh, is substantially lessened. What are you going to do? Leave Facebook? Okay, so uh, the normative takeaway from this experiment for us then was that regulators need to be most concerned, if anything, about the mild dark patterns. Because the mild dark patterns are quite effective but they don't generate the kind of consumer backlash that we saw in the aggressive dark pattern case. And if we think about the distributive consequences of dark patterns uh, on the basis of education, again, it's the mild that seem particularly problematic. And we came away thinking, at least for me, you should, I'm curious to know whether you were surprised, we thought dark patterns were surprisingly uh, uh, potent in getting people to sign up for a bogus and sort of vague data protection plan, that there's no reason to think that they would have uh, actually uh, wanted. Um, all right, I think that digital platforms and other sites have done beta testing and figured this out. My suspicion is we see so many dark patterns in the wild precisely because these kinds of techniques have been internally uh, tested. Uh, but academic researchers, at least as far as we can tell, uh, are playing catch up. And so we hope that this contribution is a way uh, to, to uh, start to catch up to what kind of research has already been done internally. Now, I think normatively, we then get into an interesting uh, legal question and a philosophical question. Persuasion is fine. Persuasion is protected by the First Amendment. Manipulation is bad and not. And so the question is, can we differentiate permissible persuasion from impermissible manipulation? And I guess what we, what we came away with, especially informed by the data, was that you could actually design a pretty good and easy legal test for which kind of dark pattern manipulations ought to be unlawful. And the test is simply that when you do the kind of beta testing that Jamie Liguri and I did, and it turns out that most of the people who are accepting the corporate preferred term are doing so because of the choice architecture, not because of a substantive desire for the program or policy at issue, then that should be the kind of dark pattern that we don't recognize as having established consumer consent and that per se the law could regard as an unfair or deceptive practice in trade. Now we want to caveat that a little bit. You need a lot of statistical power in order when you're dealing with sort of a, a neutral condition acceptance rate of 1%. 
uh, if, the, if the dark pattern manipulation shows you 3%, you're going to, you know, we're basically going to um, caveat this sub subject to confidence intervals. But, you know, given enough uh, statistical power, we ought to be able to identify any problematic dark pattern that meets that threshold. Now, that's not to say that that's a perfect test. We think that per se test would probably need to be supplemented with something that's a little bit more of a standard than a rule, because after all, a dark pattern that shifted an acceptance rate from 25% in the control group to 45% in the dark pattern manipulation still seems pretty problematic. Um, and uh, uh, you need, need to think about a more um, context sensitive kind of rule than a per se rule where the decisions are not binary, where the frameworks are not binary. And so in thinking about a non per se approach to tamping down on dark patterns, the variables of interest to us are how hidden the dark pattern is, how vulnerable people are, and whether demographic targeting is being used. All right, so that brings us to the second platform in our uh, dark pattern, which is how to determine the content, how to determine the substance of default rules. What to do when uh, contracts between platforms and individuals are uh, silent. And uh, in those instances, this is something where GDPR has uh, done something very important. Article 25 has embraced a, pre uh, a provision called privacy uh, by default. We think privacy by default has a lot to recommend it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it might not always be optimal because the way that privacy by default, at least uh, to my eyes, is written, it might not appropriately take account of all of the relevant uh, context. So by that I mean the following. There's gonna be some instances in which consumers want to store their data uh, and they want to store their data in a way that um, uh, where, where their baseline expectations, their baseline preferences are probably inconsistent with privacy by default. So think about a photo, an online photo archiving site. Well, people don't want those photos deleted after a year or after two years. At least most people don't. And as you go through e-commerce, you can probably identify some other instances like that. So what we want to say is, let's actually see if we can use consumer preferences and consumer expectations as a starting point for figuring out what the default rules should be. A really important caveat is that we think there's a broad swath of territory, maybe a broader swath of territory, where default rules are not the right way to go, where mandatory rules, in other words, unwaivable rights, are the right way to go. And so we're only talking about a slice of um, our interactions with platforms. Now, the sort of standard economic uh, approach to default rules is to look for what, what uh, law and economic scholars call majoritarian default rules. Those default terms that are favored by the majority of contracting parties, that's great if you can find them, because after all, if you just go with the majoritarian default rule, you save the parties the transaction costs of hammering out any specific uh, agreement, and then to the extent that there are people who have heterogeneous, have heterogeneous preferences, idiosyncratic preferences, they can uh, contract out of the default rule. The problem is that a lot of the settings that we're talking about, especially with respect to privacy, we're in a situation where consumers are gonna want one thing and the platforms or the firms are gonna want something else, and in those circumstances, there are no majoritarian default rules. So our approach in the presentation and in the working paper is uh, to move towards what we call consumeritarian default rules, which focus not so much on the mutual preferences, but rather on the, on the preferences of the unsophisticated party to the transaction, the party that has less um, of an ability to, to um, uh, craft uh, uh, personalized, um, non-off-the-rack terms, and the party that spends less time thinking about what the appropriate defaults uh, should be. So the basic framework we start off with is, let's figure out where consumers are, let's provide uh, firms and platforms with the opportunities to convince those consumers to opt into something else, presumably something that's friendlier to the interests of firms and platforms. But let's make it so that those requests to waive rights that are given by default have to be quite narrow in their scope. In other words, you can't bundle together a whole series of decisions, some good that the consumer will like, some bad that the consumer would, would dislike in order to stick them with the disliked terms. Moreover, we want to make sure that the interfaces that are used to secure these opt-outs of the default rules are non-manipulative, and we think the work we just showed you on dark patterns helps illustrate what non-manipulation uh, might uh, look like. The basic idea here is that we want to make it costly 
cumbersome for firms to be able to obtain from consumers these opt-outs of their default legal protections. So it's going to impose non-trivial costs on firms to get away from the defaults. And the design is basically designed not so much to inform consumers, but rather to deter them from imposing on consumers' time in the same way that Ticketmaster was imposing on my time last week. All right, so um, here's uh, some data. And again, this is from the same study that uh, Liguri and I, Jamie Liguria and I did. Uh, this was sort of the first 10 minutes. This was the ruse to get people to give us the dark pattern stuff that we were interested in at the end of the survey. And what we did is we asked consumers randomly either a series of normative questions or a series of descriptive questions about uh, their privacy preferences and presented some binary questions, some questions on a seven point uh, Likert scale. Um, to be clear, no dark patterns until after our subjects are done giving us all the information that we used in this part of the study for this part of the paper. All right. So uh, we gave them vignettes about Amazon, Facebook, Google's uh, practices, and we asked half the sample, um, is Amazon or Google allowed to do this? The other half of the sample, should Amazon or Google legally be allowed to do this? And what we see are that there are some instances, like the ones we've got on this slide, where there's a little bit of an is-ought divergence, where consumers think, OK, Google is doing this, but they ought not to be able to. Um, and what we generally found is when we tried to uh, explain to consumers the rationale for Google collecting your data, Facebook collecting your data, that actually didn't provide, um, uh, that didn't do much to shift consumers either normative or descriptive uh, data that pr they provided to us. On the other hand, there were some settings, and encryption really jumped out at us, there were some settings where consumers' normative expectations and their descriptive expectations were quite consistent with one another. Basically, consumers expect that private information they hand over, whether they be to platforms or to startups, because we randomly uh, varied that as well, uh, that that's going to be encrypted, that anything sensitive is going to be encrypted by the firm. Uh, consumers very strongly feel that that ought to be the case, but most consumers also descriptively believe that that is, in fact, the case, that that is what the law requires. Now, that's an erroneous assumption in some contexts. Okay. Now, in other contexts, consumers tell us that at least the majority of them don't expect privacy and don't prefer privacy. And so in our vignettes, the examples where this showed up most clearly were those involving geolocation information, whether that was geolocation done via GPS by Google Maps, or whether it was geolocation done via cell tower location uh, for Verizon uh, wireless uh, customers. In both of these contexts, both the normative and descriptive answers suggested that the majority of consumers were comfortable with the collection of this information, at least in certain contexts. So the caveat to this is our consumers told us that they were quite comfortable with Google Maps collecting information while the app was being used. But they also told us that if Google Apps, before, you know, as you were installing the app, got your permission to monitor your geolocation whenever your phone was on, that people's agreement to that provision, um, as a normative matter, ought not to give Google the permission to track your location whenever your phone is activated, but when the app, Google Maps, is not in use. Okay. There's a lot more work to be done on this. Uh, this was really just a first uh, cut, sort of a pilot test. Collect more data, refine the questions, determine under what circumstances we care more about normative consumer responses versus descriptive consumer responses. Um, uh, uh, some of the members of the committee have done a lot of research about the connections between those two. And I think there's a widespread belief out there that descriptive expectations drive normative preferences, and the, I think the majority of the data that's been collected on that question suggests that's not the case. Uh, we do think this can help inform uh, FTC uh, and state consumer protection judgments about what counts as an unfair or deceptive uh, practice in trade. And we think this is sort of an alternative, maybe a more palatable to American audiences, but perhaps more effective even, alternative to what GDPR is doing in Article 25. And then briefly, in the couple of minutes I've got left, let me just talk about the third uh, part of our uh, proposal, which is going to focus not on privacy, but on uh, data security. And a huge problem in data security, and uh, Blaise Orr is, uh, is in the room, and he's, uh, I think, the, uh, the leading expert uh, on this topic. A leading problem, a leading vulnerability, is about uh, password reuse. Okay? So um, you don't have to admit it out loud. Admit it to yourself. 
uh, it's possible that some of you either use identical passwords or very similar pass passwords across a variety of different platforms and uh, sites. Some people use password managers, that's really great. Most people uh, don't, and password managers have some issues of their own. And so it turns out that this is a very prevalent practice among consumers, um, and as a result, there are substantial negative externalities that can be created. If Yahoo is breached and people have the same login for Yahoo as they have for Facebook, then all of a sudden the hackers who've obtained people's Yahoo credentials might be able to log in in an unauthorized way and extract all kinds of data from Facebook. And this becomes particularly problematic if we're thinking about financial institutions. Okay, some of the platforms try to protect themselves against this problem by buying credentials from the hackers. Okay, well, you can think about perverse effects, uh, per perverse incentives that, that get created by that, but it's understandable why the platforms might do this as a way to protect their customers and to protect themselves. Now, in the full report, we marched through a couple of different candidates for what the best policy intervention on this might be. We talk about CISA, which is a 2015 um, federal statute that's designed to promote information sharing among, um, uh, among firms with respect to cybersecurity threats. We ultimately think that there's a better way forward, and where we come down on is encouraging the creation of a data breach clearinghouse. And what the clearinghouse would do is centralize people's login credentials as reported by platforms and a variety of different other sites so that there would be one point that could identify, oh, it turns out that Lior Strahilovitz is using the same password across these four different platforms, and that's a problem, so that if people with access to the central clearinghouse learn of a breach at Yahoo, and it turns out that my Yahoo credential is being used for all these other sites, the consumer could be alerted, but that's not really gonna do that much, but more importantly, the sophisticated platforms could be alerted so that they could take uh, corrective measures. There have been recent advances in private set membership testing that uh, facilitate uh, these kinds of techniques. In other words, would allow Google, Facebook to ping the central database without in so doing acquire private information that, um, uh, that people had shared uh, with other platforms or other sites. And actually, uh, Google password checkup extension is now using somewhat similar uh, techniques in order to further these laudable objectives. Now, the main source of concern here is that by creating a central database, you're creating a single point of failure. So God forbid someone manages to breach this database, and uh, obviously uh, this is a database that needs to get the highest levels of data uh, protection in order to ensure that that doesn't happen. Having said that, the committee considered these trade-offs uh, and believed that ultimately, notwithstanding that potential cost, uh, this is uh, a justified uh, policy intervention. So to summarize the three uh, solutions that, uh, that we propose, uh, first, a new framework not only for identifying, but also regulating dark patterns. Second, implementing consumeritarian default rules uh, with platforms and other sites that uh, do uh, uh, direct work with consumers online. And then finally, the creation of the privacy clearinghouse. Uh, thanks for listening, and I look forward to uh, commentary and all of your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Terrell. You're next. Okay, great. Wow, thank you. That was that was fabulous. And um, I, I, the paper's not up yet, right? Correct. So um, uh, I've had a chance to review a draft of it. It is really, really interesting work, and um, I encourage everybody to check it out once it is up. But that was a great, great preview of it. Um, I think my task is to react a little bit, and, and so I want to do that for a few minutes, and then we have uh, others that will as well, and, and then I think it'd be great to have a dialogue about what we've just heard as mm -hmm. well. So I'm going to react very, very quickly. Uh, I'm going to start by uh, disclaiming that what I'm saying is my, my own personal view, definitely not the views of Covington and Burling, the law firm I now work for, or any of my clients. Um, so. I, uh, I thought this was a really interesting contribution to the overall policy discussion and uh, that we have around privacy, but also around when we think about sort of a competition framework, whether competition enforcers can interact meaningfully with privacy, because we all wrestle with that fundamental privacy paradox, this issue of people expressing one preference and then acting in a very different way. And what do we do with that, right? How do we understand fundamentally what people really want to have happen with their data. Um, and, and also, if I, could, if I could just sort of summarize the, I think what underpins the three relatively different areas that are explored in the paper, 
is this notion that a lot of our frameworks um, are really re overly relying on people to both anticipate unwanted and unanticipated or even potentially harmful uses of their data um, and or take steps to protect themselves and their passwords and not reuse passwords, right? So there's a huge amount of fallibility in the system. Um, you know, we're all familiar with the expression that a fool and a, his money are easily parted. I think if I could summarize this paper, it would be a completely rational, totally reasonable consumer and her data can be easily parted as well. Thank you, someone laughed at my UDAP <laughs> joke and I really appreciate that. Uh, the reason I'm, I'm saying totally rational and reasonable consumer, of course, is those are the frameworks that we use in consumer protection law and deception and unfairness to decide uh, whether someone um, is uh, given adequate information if they're acting reasonably, et cetera. Um, and, the, and the paper really points out some of the limitations of that approach. Some of the limitations of, of notice and choice as well, you didn't dwell on it, but it, it takes a good firm shot in the paper at notice and choice and, and, and whether that is a, a reasonable framework to have in a digital economy. And, and I think overall is, is, is calling into question um, the rational choice theory, which is essentially the underpinning of consumer protection law in the United States. Which is, which is essentially the assumption that properly informed, reasonable consumers and individuals will make rational choices and reasonable decisions regarding what they buy and how they spend their data, if you will, and how they transact in the marketplace. And, and that um, because they're properly informed, therefore the market will react to that accordingly and everybody will be better off. Um, you know, I think we have over time started to understand and evolve, um, especially here in the US um, and at the Federal Trade Commission, my former agency, our understanding of, of, um, of whether and how to protect consumers in an environment where, where that is challenged on a routine basis. Um, and by that I mean the, the FTC with its deception authority and its unfairness authority has moved into the space, although incrementally and sort of slowly over time uh, and relatively reactively, um, in, in terms of looking at um, deceptive design of consumer interfaces. The paper mentions some of these cases, but I'll throw a few more out there that I think are worth looking at. The FTC's Venmo case, this was a case involving the uh, fact that consumers had to navigate multiple privacy settings in order to not make their transactions on um, a social network uh, payment um, platform public. So uh, are people in here Venmo users? Anybody pay their babysitter with, yeah, okay, or whatever. So those of you that are understand, um, maybe, maybe don't, and um, this is part of what the case is about, understand that the way that platform works, um, you are making public who you're paying and getting to add to descriptions of those payments, which is hilarious and interesting because obviously I'm going to be generational for a minute. Like what we want to do is make all of our payments to our friends and other people in our lives public and share those. Um, that's clear. Uh, so, so what this case was about was, okay, well, um, you have to actually like, navigate multiple settings to not have the people you're transacting with make your um, payments that you're trying to make private public, so they could publicize them essentially through their own uh, networks. Um, and so, so that was what that case was about. Also Vizio, which is a case involving connected televisions, this is one of the FTC's first IoT cases. And there the issue was um, the television was collecting uh, millisecond by millisecond precise viewing data of everything that was on the screen. So no matter where the, where the video was coming from, whether it was a game console, a cable connection, some other connection, it was collecting that information. It could identify what you were watching, cool, and then send it back uh, to Vizio. And the way to not have that setting collect that information was to go through an interface that was called the smart interactivity uh, uh, interface. So that, that was, in that case, um, you know, I think clearly not adequate to, do, to allow people to make a choice about whether they wanted that kind of very precise granular viewing information about coming from their screen to be shared back with the television manufacturer and ultimately monetized. The FTC has also used its unfairness authority, and, and the paper touches on this a little bit, but I also think 
this is a little bit where you were going with, um, with okay, how do we think about dark patterns and whether um, the current consumer protection framework can either address them in deception, in some of the ways I was just talking about, or unfairness. Um, Unfairness is, it, it's a harder authority in this space for sure, um, but the FTC has used it in a series of, of privacy and data related cases, um, including collection and use of information and knowing violation of a privacy policy, selling confidential phone records without consent, designing software that causes consumers to unwittingly share files publicly, defeating privacy choices by consumers, that's Enmobi, which I think you do reference, installing spyware without notification or consent, selling information to businesses, uh, they're using it for fraud, unfair tracking without consent, revenge porn, um, failure to maintain reasonable security, of course, in those data security cases. So I think one of the, the questions is really, um, are some of these dark patterns significant enough uh, or, or deceptive enough that in fact they're already actionable under consumer protection law. And of course, I'm talking about the federal US law, but there is also state consumer protection law that is um, uh, relatively consistent with the, with the federal framework. Um, and then getting into the, the more challenging question here, I think ultimately, and, and I applaud the paper for attempting to design a legal test. I think that's always really rewarding. It's good to see the problem explained and the data underpinning it. Uh, but it's, it's hard sometimes to then think about how to map that onto, onto a legal framework. Um, you know, I think the challenge is ultimately going to be uh, really defining the harm. The harm obviously being, um, you know, conceptually manipulation. But the challenge is going to be some percentage of the people are actually choosing something and then receiving what they chose, right? And, and in your hypothetical, it's uh, a service. So then they're getting that, right? So, so okay, how, how are they harmed? And the harm question really comes down to, well, they wouldn't have done it otherwise, right? And I think that that's um, something that this paper helps both inform, but will be something that legally people will wrestle with. I just wanted to skip through quickly to default rules. Um, the paper has a really interesting discussion around default rules. You covered it really quickly. Uh, consumeritarian default rules. You know, I think this is the, the real challenge here is that right now we've already been talking about how um, difficult it is to rely so heavily on end users and consumers to act rationally and transact with systems that they don't totally understand. Um, creating defaults might help in that way, but it also might create enhanced consumer confusion around what the settings are in the first place or which defaults are in place in what situations. Um, I'm a, for example, I'm a relatively privacy sensitive user of technology. It's probably not surprising. Um, my, uh, the, I share my geolocation very sparingly with any apps I use that, um, that really need my geolocation. So mapping apps, ride hailing apps, ride sharing apps, those kinds of things. Um, it can be very, very useful to share your geolocation, especially if you don't exactly know where you are and you're trying to get a car to come pick you up. Um, but I don't leave those on all the time, so I toggle them on and off. Uh, I'm guessing the majoritarian, consumeritarian view of that would be most people would be like, yeah, I share my geolocation with those apps because that's the way they work best for me most easily with the least friction, right? So then I'm a privacy sensitive person, I'm now having to like interact with that default and make sure it's flipped the other way. Uh, you know, I think that's just something to, to think about. Um, lastly, the clearinghouse idea I think is really interesting. Again, underscoring the fact that people, uh, people create a lot of security problems by re reusing passwords this is a big challenge. You, you already hit the nail on the head in terms of the big vulnerability, which is the clearinghouse itself then becomes massive a uh, huge security vulnerability uh, in and of itself. Um, you know, unfortunately, we've seen the consequences of very significant breaches of very rich information like the Equifax breach, which essentially renders people identity insecure. I worry about, about that vulnerability, um, but you, you identified it, so I suppose the brilliant computer security people that will be thinking about how to, how to make sure that's a secure environment um, could think about that issue. It would be far better, of course, if we moved off of that whole system into something much stronger. <laughs>
So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Um, thanks uh, for comments. I guess I was invited here because I, I'm not a privacy scholar. I'm a law professor. I'm a colleague of Lior. And in the spirit of University of Chicago, I'm going to disagree with him today. I was invited here because I study more general I I problems of consumer contracting, uh, failures of consumer contracting and techniques on how to address them. And recently, I did take a kind of a, an I made an attempt to think uh, differently about the problem of data protection and data uh, collection in our society. So I tried to unify these two things and, th and uh, um, uh, explain how I differ with the uh, authors of this uh, uh, report. Uh, now, I did not know what they found about dark patterns. I was not that aware of dark patterns, although every time you do check out from buying an airline ticket, you go through a mild dark pattern, you have to buy, decline the junk insurance product that uh, these websites, it never seemed to me to be a big <coughs> problem, but now I realize I undercounted the effect of these things. I don't think that this is a problem of data issues. I think that uh, urges, urging people to buy add-on products that are not necessary and overpriced at a moment in ways that are somewhat deceptive is a general problem. In the world of deception, I think these are relatively mild. I teach deception law, FTC law, and Lanham Act, and you kind of say your jaw drops when you see the things that are done. So this is a little worse than a deceptive uh, product placement on shelves and things like this. It may be significantly worse, but uh, I, and, and it does call for some intervention. But I think that this panel was convened to think about problems of data sharing, data collection, and the uses of data that are done not in deceptive ways, namely that are collected people without dark patterns. I think probably, I don't know the numbers there, but probably the great majority of data that is collected would be collected by the likes of Amazon, um, Amazon Google, Facebook, and others without the use of uh, um, dark patterns. So that's where the solution that the, 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 the report really has is taking a brave and I think a kind of a significant uh, uh, approach to the, to the problem. So just to summarize, I think that they view the problem in the area of privacy, and this is not focusing specifically on the dark patterns, as loss of, and this is quoting from the report, loss of privacy and control leading to psychological and financial harm to the people whose data is being harvested and used in ways that they have not expected or anticipated. And therefore, the main solutions is to enact consumeritarian default rules, to allow opt-out only in a, in a more kind of informed and persuaded way, persuade people if you want them to opt out, and prohibit these dark patterns to the extent that that also is a part of the problem in the privacy context. Um, so I like the point about prohibiting dark patterns, although I'm not exactly sure how uh, to conceptualize the, you know, what do you uh, forbid uh, people to sell, but uh, let's f think about that separately. I don't want to take, uh, spend a couple of minutes um, I, talking about my problems with the solutions, and in the end, if I have time, I'll say a couple of words about my problem with how the problem is conceptualized. I view the problem differently. Um, so an act consumeritarian default rules, so the report was, wants to use consumers' preferred uh, starting point as a default rule, namely identify consumer preferences via surveys and use these preferences as default rules, consumeritarian default rules. And I have here, I just have two questions. First, is there a meaning to stating preferences when not priced? Asking you consumers what they want without asking them what, how much you know, it will be will willing to pay. Uh, when they, especially when these seem to conflict with revealed preferences, and that's what is known as the privacy paradox. People are not behaving in the same way that they state that they are. So that, that's whole, the area of contingent valuation in economics has wrestled with these issues. I'm worried that we are replicating some of the con uh, issues that were methodological issues there. And secondly, are these preferences that are reported in issue-specific surveys. In this particular website, what, how much are you willing to pay not to have the, are they consistent with people's income constraints? 
Once you ask people in all these contexts, not in individual survey, how much, how important it is to them in terms of their willing to pay part with cash to secure their data currency, and ask them not only in the data area, but in all the other things that are waived in standard contract terms, like in intellectual property rights, rights to sue rather than go to arbitration, you might get to a lot of money that people don't have. So I'm a little concerned about that, uh, the whole idea of identifying consumeritarian default rules by asking uh, consumers. But uh, that's, uh, so that's one issue. Um, uh, as the baseline of the solution seems to be, uh, um, at least needs uh, methodologically to have some, uh, some problems. But then uh, a b bigger issue that I find is to allow opt-out only if informed, so that the report wants to default rules can be waived if firms are able to convince consumers that waiving these rights is worthwhile, enable consumers to make well-informed decisions about trade-offs. Well, I, I wrote a book about these things. It's, it's called More Than You Wanted to Know. It's about the failure of attempts to give people information to make better decisions in all of consumer life, uh, credit, uh, financial decisions, medical decisions, insurance decisions. Uh, Miranda warnings is an attempt to inform consumers before they decide. You know, there are many ways in which the law really favors. It's probably, I, in my book, I thought that I wrote that uh, co-written co book. Uh, we thought with my co-author that this is the most common technique in American law to protect people and at the same time also the least successful. There's just no evidence that it works ever. Um, and the, the, the question here is how do you convince and well inform consumers about the context of data sharing? Um, there are high hopes to this technique. It is not the first time I, I see this. Um, and I'll just share with you a quick survey of how, the, how high the hopes are. Um, so uh, distinguished um, writers have written about problem that I dare say is probably more urgent for consumers, which is terrible, catastrophic credit decisions that they take, cred credit uh, that they make. Uh, so they say borrowers, they say, should receive the standard mortgage offered. The standard mortgage would be the, the consumertarian mortgage, the plain vanilla risk-free mortgage. And uh, offered unless they choose to opt out in favor of another option after the lender's honest and comprehensible disclosures about the risks of alternative mortgages. Um, and in, in order that it would be, it requires a heightened disclosures. And in other places, they said, actually, this is a one size, they call it a one size fits all solution to all consumer issues, pro consumer default rule, and firms must provide meaningful disclosures to those whom they convince to op opt out and uh, in the context of insurance uh, disclosures, the Consumer Federation of America is pleading for consumers having access to timely and meaningful information about, look at the list of the things that you need to educate people. Insurance is very costly and very complicated. So there are all sorts of efforts on how to do it, how to actually implement this uh, persuasion, convincing, well-informing consumers in the context of a rental purchase. These are rent to own products that people, you know, poor people make, uh, disastrously make, uh, provide meaningful disclosures to consumers. Uh, online advertising, make clear and consumer conspicuous disclosures. Telemarketers, clear and conspicuous disclosures. Truth in Lending Act, uh, to assure meaningful disclosure of credit terms to the, everybody wants to do, everybody is fighting uh, and look at the Federal Bank of, uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia talking about prepaid cards, the form of payment uh, method that many poorer people use and are taking for a ride, paying you know, a bundle of junk fees and all sorts of scams. So what is the solution? Well, ensuring that card users understand how they work, right? You begin to see the pattern, right? So there is endless advocates and regulators and courts and well-meaning you know, uh, uh, reformers wanting to get into people's mind and educate them, make them well informed about things that are complex, that you can't, you will not have not succeeded in one, not to mention the whole, uh, um, you know, potpourri of information that are, is lavished on people in, in order to, to persuade them.
Uh, and uh, rea indeed, the, disappoint real the fact that uh, reality is disappointing is not uh, surprising. How do you make things, how do you make disclosures meaningful? Everybody is working on it. Simplification, well, yeah, but then people don't see the whole pictures and make bad decisions. Besides, that too doesn't seem to work in, so, in a, you know, mountains of empirical evidence as showing disappointing, if not null, results to all sorts of simplification efforts. Um, the problem, I think, is not that there is a kind, there's no magic way to persuade people when something is complex. It takes time and experience to master a complex decision problem, and people can't master everything. And that's why that creates problems of overload and accumulation, consent fatigue, uh, decision aversion, and particularly, it is hopeless in low stakes context. I would put first, persuade, teach people to make, take better mortgages. That's the one decision that could ruin their financial life if they make bad. Then start staggering which are more important, less important. I'm not sure, I don't want to take a view on where privacy would stand there, but see what enormous rivals it has for the desire to inform people and to make better decisions. Just one last example. Obama, um, ACA, the Affirmative uh, uh, Care Act, wanted to inform consumers about health plans. You make an important decision mm -hmm. about health plans. So they designed this really nice and simple and informative and launched it with all sorts of in informing and, uh, consumers on how to do it with all sorts of aids. Um, and that too, uh, it, it can, the mandate said, that the statute said, give people information to make health plans comparable like nutrition labels, another myth that that really helps people make better decisions, again, not uh, supported by the evidence. Forms were developed and tested in libraries. Everything was done right and was mandated to do this way. But when asked to compare costs in common scenarios, the vast majority of people were still confused in real world, not in the laboratory. They did not understand concepts like deductibles, annual limits, and a long other list of other things, and having to make these Determ the determinations based on the disclosures frustrated people, often led them to select, very often led them to select plans not actually in their best interest. So the efforts are there, the thinking to do it is not new. It just is not working and we don't know how to make it work. And in my view, we cannot make something complex simple, we cannot make people experts in everything. The, uh, so I guess I don't buy into the solution of consumeritarian default rules with informed opt-out. Now, there could be something not informed opt-out, and it's stressed more in uh, Lior's excellent presentation, made me think about, I didn't get it in the report, but I'll just say a few words about it. Say, make it really costly and long and frustrating to opt-out. Make people have to not just inf face one pop, GDPR pop-up saying, oh, you know, we have cookies that you close, that people view not as an information device, of course, but a box to close, a nuisance to close, but do this more and more and more and more times. At some point, people will say, no, we don't agree. We don't do this. What could happen here? One of two things. Informed people will not happen. Let's set that aside. People might be, some people might do it because they really do want to do things on Facebook and they're willing to endure the hassle and the nuisance of closing bo uh, junk boxes, or they will be deterred in the uh, altogether from using that. Uh, that the you know, they will, be, uh, will walk away. Maybe firms will begin to separate, select people, but they're not selecting people on the basis of the feature that really matters to us, namely how important is privacy to them. They're selecting people on the basis of how costly it is to them to uh, they're separating people according to how costly it is to them to endure the hassle, the nuisance. I have to say, I think that if you, the idea is to deter firms from using, from asking for these waivers, why not just, you know, uh, say it? Let's, not, let's prohibit that. It's things that want firms to not do uh, come out and say, this is uh, not allowed. I understand that that's not consistent with consumer choice, but harassing consumers into legally mandated dark patterns, namely closing boxes and after boxes that the law mandates platforms to give them, doesn't seem to me to be an attractive way to replace a mandatory rule. Finally, if I have a minute or two, I want to talk about the problem. Loss of privacy and control leading to psychological and financial harm. Um, 
I have a feeling that, or I have a sense that's been kind of brewing in me over the last few years thinking about it, that maybe privacy protection is not exactly the right goal <laughs> to talk about it. Data privacy is viewed as the dominant problem, harm to the people whose data is taken um, in, and uh, collected, used in ways that ultimately hurts their interests psychologically and financially. But, and then if that is the problem, it seems sensible that privacy protection, protecting these people against the platforms that, pre the predatory platforms would be the organizing principle for solutions. And that's why the GDPR and many solutions mandate and even this report talks about some form of user control and meaningful contracting. Contract is still the solution. People will, will protect themselves if you just give them the way to contract optimally rather than suboptimally. Um, I view data's harm as a public, not private. I think that the harm is to social environments, not to individuals. The, it is political harm, it information to political and informational ecosystems. I don't think that Cambridge Analytica and whatever harm was caused, if, you know, if that can be measured, is to the people whose data was used, or who were fed political lies, but rather to the election, the integrity of our election process. Maybe even these people the, who were manipulated are happy. They don't feel injured, but there is a sense of injury. And in many other contexts, we can talk about it. There is the harm is environmental rather than individual. Um, and sometimes, as in the example that Lior gave of 23andMe, the effect is on other people. Now, I'm not, I think that the effect of data is not negative necessarily. There are environmental effects that are positive and sometimes they can orders of magnitude greater than the harms. But if there are harms, there are negative externalities. And there, when we th think about externalities, it is not usually, we don't uh, protect the people who are causing the externalities, who are giving their data, who are driving hammers and saying we have to protect them. We have to protect against them, against their decision. And so to put it bluntly, I think user control and informed out is not the solution if users are creating negative externalities. I understand they are not active participants. They have not sat in smoke-filled rooms and thought, how do we pollute the world? But they are happily using data instead of cash for activity and that causes, that causes harm. And so user, uh, under this idea of data pollution, uh, this paradigm, data givers are not those in need of protection, but those from whom the ecosystem has to be protected. And uh, it doesn't have to be, they don't have to be punished. You can do it all through the platforms. But in a way that affects what the platforms make the people do, how they, you may, it causes them to pollute. And so I wrote a paper about this called Data Pollution uh, Working Draft. I'm still thinking about these issues, about kind of thinking about it as an environmental law problem for data protection. They're, like an environmental law, we need prohibitions like the GDPR, but they have to be tailored to identify problems type of data that is particularly harmful and to make sure that, like in environmental law, we don't stop innovation. Uh, I think the more kind of interesting for an economist, the more interesting idea is the data tax. Tax the taking of data so as to reflect a Pigouvian tax to reflect its social uh, effect. And in the context of data leaks, like um, oil leaks, like spills, when data where Equifax loses the data, <coughs> It's ridiculous to say to people, you go and sue for this. Of course, they can't sue, they can't prove causation, they can't prove their injury. But we know roughly, and the FTC has reports that estimate the, uh, rel the uh, proportional effect or the uh, average effect on individuals, 130 million people lost all, they lost the, all the financial data of 130 mi million Americans. There will be so many uh, identity thefts and frauds occurred, you know, the ratio, the cost, the average cost is so much can immediately hit uh, the, uh, the spillers, the losers of this, the, that engaged, you know, strict liability. It doesn't have to be any, who cares what they did? You lost it, you pay. It turns out to be, I don't know, $100 per file, $25 per file, whatever the estimate, the proportional liability that is based on the data is, would create an incentive to limit these kind of spills. So that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Lorenzo, you respond first, so what do you yes. think? Yes, okay. I, oh, I get to respond? Yes. Well, thank you, uh, and thank you for the terrific and uh, thought-provoking uh, comments. I'll address some of them, um, and, and then I'll, I guess we'll open it for 
uh, for questions. So just a quick uh, summary of, of what Lior uh, presented. So there's enough reason to believe, I wasn't at yesterday's panel, but I guess I gave even additional reason uh, to believe that there would be some market failures <coughs> in the context of, of privacy and, uh, and digital platforms on our proposed uh, approaches. We have some uh, potential solutions to address at least some of them, uh, not without challenges, of course, I'll get, it, get into that in a second. Well, the first is this idea of mandatory and default rules. One of the uh, most problematic uh, aspects in this space is that there aren't any default rules whatsoever, and so many times uh, regulators are at a loss when they're trying to uh, bring actions against uh, firms engaged in potentially deceptive practices, because many times these practices are not stated in privacy policies, um, and so uh, it's, it's very hard to, um, to use the, their uh, consumer protection uh, arsenal. Uh, Terrell talked about unfairness, uh, which is which is a great tool, but it's 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 not used as much because it's harder to uh, it, it's harder to to use um, effectively. Deception is a, is is another where uh, the uh, Federal Trade Commission and and state AGs using little FTC acts need to rely on some stated policy, <laughs> some some stated practices. O omissions uh, are sometimes uh, are, uh, are are broad, but it's not it, it's not with the same. Uh, it, it's, it's not as, as easily uh, done. And the same is true for um, not consumers, because they don't really read much, but for intermediaries who might be uh, willing to maybe inform consumers or more likely journalists uh, who then get to inform consumers with uh, shocking uh, news stories. So, so silence in this space is, is problematic, and this is where we uh, come up with. And also uh, picking up some mandatory rules to take away from the consumer the responsibility of, of becoming informed and, and continuing to make uh, choices on, on many uh, aspects of their, of their lives, then uh, eliminate their uh, pattern, oh, oops, I'm missing an end there, behavior as a deceptive uh, practice. Um, I'll, I'll get more into it a little bit uh, later. And then address the password problem with uh, data breach uh, uh, clearing houses. So, so the first thing, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, reply to um, some of Omri's uh, point, at, at least in the last part of his presentation, about uh, the assumptions of maybe consumers are really, are they not receiving their desired privacy terms? Maybe this data, this uh, privacy paradox uh, problem can just be explained, as Omri said, by not, not by a lack of consumer interest, but maybe they're just getting what they want, uh, or there are no, not many concern in, in private harms. Um, um, but, not, but not really, maybe they're more focused on, on social harms as opposed to, uh, to the private ones. Alternatively, it could, the privacy paradox, this, this discrepancy between what consumers say they want and, and how they act, and I guess the say they want in service has a, a, a soul, uh, another host of, of problems, but another reason why this might be the case is that there's a fundamental misunderstanding and a, and a, and a difficulty in ascertaining potential costs and harms, particularly when these are uh, an, of, of an unknown um, nature. So the existence of, of private harms and the associated market failures that might cause them is, is really an empirical question. Um, so, okay. So is privacy in this context, in the, pri in the private realm, um, a problem? And Alessandra Quisti, who's here, who's done a lot of work in this, uh, in this area, um, he has an excellent uh, article where he shows that consumers have a hard time conceptualizing unknown harms and a series of experiments and studies uh, showing or providing some evidence and support for that particular problem. Not that they don't care, but it's just very hard to, to understand. And he analogizes to this idea of writing a, a blank check. You just don't know what, what the damage is going to be uh, by the end of it. But there's also some additional um, evidence on this. There's an article, for example, that consumers um, Learn, and, and this also by uh, Alessandro, they, they learn their in, in Facebook, they track consumers, uh, actual Facebook users over time, and, and they find that once cons consumers learn about their environment and they learn how to, you know, the, the different privacy trade offs and, and the potential harms and how to navigate this, uh, they, they take increasingly privacy protective actions. So there's some evidence that, there's, that, that conduct uh, reveals some, some privacy preferences. Um, also, there's a really interesting um, study by uh, Catherine uh, Tucker and co-author 
where they found that after the Snowden revelations, they used Google Trends data to show that when people are become aware that they're being watched, they censor themselves in the types of searches that they engage in. This is not a survey, uh, so it, it has uh, a, a bit more of a, a, a validation, so they, they, they're less likely to look for uh, medical uh, things or potentially embarrassing searches, even though these might be uh, these might be beneficial for them to know. They're just basically depriving themselves of, of knowledge. So there's some evidence um, of this, and, and ton, there, also there's countless uh, of media attention to this. Um, if, if we assume that uh, newspapers and, and media are interested in captivating their, their readers, you'd, you'd assume that they want to focus on, uh, on content that consumers and, uh, and readers care about, and the, and the salient attention to privacy might be uh, might be some example of this. So the What They Know series, another New York Times has this privacy project where every, every day there's a different um, article on this. Um, of course, there's also public harms, like Omri said. So examples like Cambridge Analytica and various uh, data security breaches show that privacy harms can also be very public. So right, the, uh, threatening democracy or, or making all sorts of uh, private information, financial information uh, vulnerable is another uh, public harm. Um, and these could be regulated as externalities in the way that Omri proposes in his uh, uh, extremely interesting article. Our focus here, though, is mostly on private harms. The uh, passport clearinghouse could, could address the, uh, the private harm, that, that, uh, the public harm that Omri uh, talked about. So, so both approaches, so we don't think of it as an either or. It's not either a public harm or a private harm. They could both coexist. So regulation for public harms and default rules or anti-deception for manipulative uh, choice architecture can both coexist and they could address problems uh, in different uh, targeted ways. So, so that's the public versus uh, private. private. Uh, and then um, focusing now on the uh, disclosure and the stickiness and, and default rule approach that, that we talk about. So, um, so uh, Omri rightly points out and Terrell rightly points out that the, there's too much too much burden imposed on consumers, and uh, disclosure is highly unlikely to work. I, I too do research on disclosure, and I too find that it doesn't work. Um, so our approach would ideally limit disclosures to only those terms where firms have significant interest in, in opting out. So just to very, because, it, because the opt out is so costly, just very few terms would, uh, uh, would be the ones where firms uh, opt out of. Omri raises a really interesting point of uh, maybe this uh, opt out architecture would end up segregating people by patience and not by preference and this is something that we uh, need to think about. The, the trade off of that is that this particular choice preserves flexibility and it, so mandatory rules are great if you identify them well and you have a particular uh, uh, setup of, of, of consumers but what if there's heterogeneity there's, and, 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 and what if you don't really know what the rules are and what if the environment like, is so dynamic that needs to adapt to new scenarios and also new preferences. So when you have these conditions, you can't really take everything into account and you need to make some choices. And one is just to create some rigidity that, pres that preserves the benefits of the uh, mandatory rules and that it relieves consumers uh, for, uh, uh, from some uh, choices, but it also allows for some flexibility uh, when regulators might not know what's, uh, what's best and when, and when uh, preferences are heterogeneous and, and also when the environments are, uh, are changing. So um, it also con uh, con provides continuous feedback by seeing what these opt-outs are. Uh, regulators and the market can also um, learn. And, um, so, and also reducing the number of terms can also increase the likelihood that they be may become salient to consumers. So we're now we're just not talking about the uh, ticket master dark, dark pattern where the, you get sig uh, a, a, a sequence of, of, of choices that you need to make, but, but very few, ideally. How, how many? That, that's, a, that's a harder question that comes in a later slide. Um, so, but, right, can disclosure ever be meaningful, right? Omri said, you know, he'd be pointed out all of these disclosures that talk about meaningful and knowingly, and it just seems, it seems great in theory, completely unworkable, uh, in practice, because there's this aggregation, right? You have to agree, meaningfully agree to everything. And who has time to do that, right? So that would reduce a regime's uh, effectiveness. But that being said, pointed disclosures might work in specific uh, 
very specific context. And there's a little bit of uh, evidence. Uh, there's some evidence that, that, that might offer a little hope. So there's a, a, a very recent study that shows that uh, they, they, they were interested in the extent to which ad transparency might affect the effectiveness of the ads. And they found that it did, that when, when the ad um, does not reflect the expected information flows when you know, it, it tracks you from some weird other, uh, from, from three sites ago, consumers feel a bit um, irritated by it and, and they're less likely to purchase that product. That's not, that's the, the purpose of the study was to focus on ad effectiveness. I was mostly interested in, in the fact that the disclosure of the, of the purpose of the ad actually had an impact on behavior, meaning that the disclosure might have been uh, somewhat, uh, might have been absorbed by, uh, by consumers. Um, and then uh, Cass Sunstein has been working on uh, disclosures and choice architecture in which might play a role in this. And I know we, we have, there's some disagreements about whether this might uh, work or not, particularly when consumers are uninformed, which is, which is a, a big, uh, um, that, that, that should be at the center of the, of the design of uh, default rules. That being said, there's still plenty of mandatory rules. So there, as I said earlier, there are no default rules in the privacy context. So having something, even if it gets opted out of, can actually alleviate a lot of the problems that regulators face when trying to bring uh, actions against um, firms. Um, dark patterns and relative uh, deceptive practices could be prohibited. Terrell rightly points out, um, and, and Omri does uh, as well, that, well, there, there's nothing new here, right? This is just a, you know, deceptive practices happen everywhere. And um, it's not just common to this environment. However, by identifying these particular practices, it could, it could help create uh, the, the type of attention that, for example, post-transaction post marketing did a few years ago, and, and that resulted in a bill that basically eliminated it. And that, goes, that relates to the Terrell's point about how to identify the harm. So post-transaction marketing happens when you, you check out of a known vendor, and then um, there is this uh, pop-up that comes up that says that if you click on this or if you put your email address, you're going to get 10% of your next purchase. You don't, you know, unbeknown to you, you're just basically subscribing to some kind of savings club, and then you know, by all, you're also agreeing to having the original, uh, the original firm transferring your uh, credit card information to this post-transaction vendor in a practice called Data Pass, and and then a few months later, you're just starting to get charged, and then. A, Maybe a few years later, you realize that you've been getting this like $4.99 or $12.99 bill in your credit card, and you just don't know what it was. It was for a reward fund club that you just didn't know how great it was because you never accessed it. So what the FTC uh, did in those cases, and then eventually what uh, 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 Congress did, was just create uh, a, a law that prohibited that. And the harm was identified by, by identifying the, the very low take-up rate in these particular things. So if the, if the insurance concept if the insurance uh, uh, offered is, is, is never invoked at all, or, or if the product looks, uh, uh, looks extremely uh, fishy, this, this could help, for example, prohibit certain types of uh, dark patterns. So in that sense, it could be um, helpful. The data breach uh, clearinghouse could also address some uh, private um, harms. Um, and then we also talk about some implementation suggestions, this idea of a data-driven approach to identify, to identify uh, welfare-enhancing mandatory rules and default rules, of course, asking people in, in the abstract whether they want a, a rule is, is, is not very useful. This is this idea of, of trade-offs, and I know that Lior's uh, study has, has incorporated some of, uh, some of that, to what extent people are willing to uh, part with things. There's also some interesting research being done on that, the extent to which people are willing to pay for particular things. Um, uh, the same is true for opt-outs and, and tested for uh, effectiveness. And we also talked about dark patterns and clearing houses. Um, you know, of course, like all other recommendations, our approaches are not without challenges. And I know that's in the spirit of this uh, uh, conference. I know in earlier discussions with uh, Luigi said you have to identify the problems too, since it's part of the solution. So, so I'll do that now. So of course, correctly identifying which terms uh, should be mandatory is not without challenge, but it, it's not unsurmountable. There are mandatory rules in other uh, spaces. Um, and then there's the additional challenge, given that this is a highly dynamic environment, identify and update which are these uh, mutually uh, preferred terms. 
and, and then adopt, adopting the type of opt-out mechanisms that avoid the types of problems that OMRI created. And also it's important to keep in mind that when we talk about default rule architecture, we need to, usually when we think about um, uh, default rules in the context of a, in a, in a, a commercial context, there's, a, there's the assumption that both parties are, are informed. Here, uh, parties are, uh, the consumers are, are not informed. And so um, in, in an excellent uh, recent article, Omri and uh, Oren uh, Bar Bargill uh, talk, uh, talk about and tackle this question about what happens when consumers are uninformed and how do you define and how do you create default rules when you might have some uninformed opt-out. So, that, so that's something that we would need to uh, take in, into account um, at all as well. And then finally, with dark patterns in this case and, and in others, how to identify the threshold upon which choice framings become manipulative, and that relates to uh, Terrell's uh, uh, point. So conclusion, uh, we present an innovative approaches to address uh, important problems in the consumer uh, privacy uh, context that you know, they, they still need to be worked out. Uh, we, we, we do think that they have a potential to, to be helpful if ascertained and, and implemented um, correctly. This idea of identifying and implemented default rule, like, most specifically to fill in this contractual, uh, this, this uh, current silence, which is so problematic. This idea of creating pro-consumer bias for those terms of uh, whether there's preferences or expectations that might differ, this needs to be worked out uh, further, uh, given all of the uh, problems and challenges I identified before, prohibit manipulative practice and address password vulnerabilities. Thank you so much, and we look forward to your comments. Thank you. I'll do this very quickly, then I'll open to questions. So uh, I think first to Terrell and Lior. So can you convince and have well-informed consumers, or is it a lost cause? What do you think? Oh, is that for me? Yeah. Um, is there any hope for that? Is, is it a lost cause? Yeah, oh, right. that's so depressing. <laughs> uh, um, well, look, I think what we've been discussing is the fact that privacy is a very important value in the digital economy and that having right-sizing uh, protections for privacy and regulations around privacy is really important. But uh, in and of itself is probably not adequate for all of the different um, potentially harmful scenarios that people need to navigate in a digital economy. So I think this kind of work is, is a helpful contribution to that. I also think um, deception, unfairness, consumer protection authority, very useful. Again, um, in and of itself, probably not adequate um, and that continuing to scope some of the harms that we're talking about is really, really important, right? We need to have that inform the kind of protection that we need. At the end of the day, um, you know, I think this conversation fundamentally also comes down to a, a conversation about consumer trust. Right now we see um, unanticipated uses of data as uh, having badly frayed consumer trust in technology. When that trust is frayed, it actually affects demand potentially. We all ought to be very concerned about that from an innovation policy perspective because I think we want consumers to trust technology, adopt technology use technology, create demand in the marketplace for technology so that we can get innovation and competition and all these other benefits. So I, I think that is also part of this conversation and, and a really um, important piece of it. You know, I, I think we have to, to get all of these things right. I think we will over time and, and I'm an optimistic person. So yes, I think the answer is we're making a lot of progress and this is, uh, this is a helpful contribution to that discussion. Lior, how would you respond to Amri? Uh, I, well, this is really a response to your question, but maybe it'll work its, it work its way back to Omri and, and Terrell. You both made really helpful comments and, and they'll improve the report greatly. Um, I don't think that trying to inform consumers is a lost cause but I think it is usually not the best place for regulatory resources to be invested. Um, so I think uh, while I uh, basically persuaded by uh, Omri and Carl's book on mandated disclosure, I do think there's actually, I, I think I would put it a little bit differently. I would say um, informed consent typically doesn't, mandated disclosure typically doesn't do very much good, but there are contexts in which it can do some good. Um, and so there's a paper we both know by Manisha Padi in the, in the mortgage disclosure context that cuts against some of the earlier research. I'm a Bayesian, so that moves me a little bit, not a lot. I don't overreact to her paper, but I think it was really thoughtfully and, and smartly done. Um, but more generally, I think even in our own data, 
you can see that certain kinds of disclosures to consumers do move consumers even when we're talking about revealed preferences. So think back to our data and show and remember how much work just putting highly recommended after a choice did in terms of shifting people from no's to yeses. So there's certain kinds of inform information that will move consumers and I think the really interesting empirical project is to try and disaggregate those kinds of strategies that fail from those kinds of strategies that succeed. The problem is that highly recommended is shifting consumers, it's not informing them. It's, uh, it turns out to be uh, manipulating them from our, uh, from our perspective. Um, and then I guess the, um, the I think the, the point that Omri made that's, um, uh, that's really interesting about, well, you know, paradoxically, are we kind of using dark patterns to manipulate consumers in a place where we think mandatory rules are not the right intervention? That's a great, that's a great point, I think. And I guess what I would say is the following. Um, again, some of our data about the, about the consumer backlash that results when aggressive dark patterns are used suggest that that consumer annoyance is real and that that consumer annoyance in cases where firms are deciding that it's really important to extract a whole bunch of OKs from consumer will cause them to direct some of the hostility back at firms, which will erode firms' goodwill. And the fear of eroding some of that goodwill will in turn deter asking for permission, except when it's really, um, really, really important to the firm and where they think they'll be able to persuade a lot of, a lot of consumers. So to me, the right mix is kind of an, a, a good mix of mandatory rules uh, these um, uh, and these uh, uh, default terms that are that are customizable, but only customizable at some cost to the to the platform. Uh, Omri, a quick take, then I have time for mm -hmm. one question. Okay. I get from I the just want to uh, imagine the transaction that consumer enter sits in front of a, and enters a website, and there are terms and conditions, including the privacy policy terms and conditions, and you've chosen to focus on the privacy issues and say they'll have the most important thing to them there they'll have to show consumers to get attention. But I think the most important thing is probably not in the, you know, not just in the privacy uh, condition, and the, the, f they want you to agree to arbitration. They want you to disclaim all the warranties that the law otherwise gives you. They want you to agree to limitation on remedies. They want you to give up the intellectual property rights that you have in any content that you give. All of these things are critical, uh, you know, as part of the business pattern. And the question is how, not how do you get them to Peop get people to disclaim the privacy default, but think about the, the whole uh, landscape of default rules that are being disclaimed when people enter into transaction, and that was just one. Immediately thereafter, they went from ESPN.com to another to to another website to Twitter. They have to do it all over again. I just at some point you have to recognize showing people boxes and asking them to click is uh, you know is not going to work in regulating all of these things. Um, and so it's, uh, the result is you can't get people's consent for anything. And the effect is opting into, you know, through the back door into a mandatory regime in which firms cannot opt out of what otherwise was enacted as default rules. Now, I'm not against that, but that's conceptually what it, it ends up collapsing into. That's my concern. Just, just, a, just a quick, quick response. I think that your concern would be uh, folded into our, the point where we would consider different design features. So one, one area where it's not so, uh, Terrell was talking about how she manages her default of privacy constantly. So a lot, a lot of the times the apps on the phone will ask you, do you want to share your, at the time in which you're about to invoke the app, and not every time, do you want to uh, uh, be tracked uh, geolocationally even when the app is turned off? At, at the moment, you make the choice, you, you think about it. And after a while, I, I make informed choices. I, I learn what it means. It's not so terrible. Now, being bombarded with, with, uh, with uh, click wraps that you click on, click on I agree would be a terrible way of implementing this. And that's where the uh, data-driven and tested approach would come in so that all of these problems would hopefully be addressed. I think I have time for one quick question, uh, Amat. Uh, one thing you didn't mention uh, in dark patterns that you you know one example is where you just can't finish the transaction without clicking through some of that. But there's a quick video about uh, signing off Amazon, which is really pretty shocking. Uh, it really is very difficult to sign off Amazon. So the website's very uh, complicated, 
and it's not obvious even how to get there. It's not under uh, my account or my thing. It's, it's actually amazing. You have to click 10 things, and then you can't even close it yourself. You have to talk to them first, and then they can close it for you. So basically, it's a roach motel. Come in and never come out. And uh, so some of these things are just so obvious should be illegal. It's not possible that you would sign up to something and it would take you mm -hmm. a lot of annoyances to, to sign out. So in a few, there are so low-hanging fruits in some of these cases, and I agree with, you know, I think. So anyway, so I, I think you might look around at the practices and, and just some stuff should be immediately illegal. My husband told me that LinkedIn, which we never signed up for, um, still uh, people think he has an account there because okay, so people shared emails, addresses. So very quickly, what should be legal and what should be left to the consumeritarian defaults? Um, you know, I'd really like if we could, if there were other questions too, maybe we can get two or three questions and then to answer no, them in lightning round, or are we out of time? Yeah, we're out of time. I mean, I th so I think what I would say is there, there are papers out there that try and look at, um, at dark patterns on some of the major platforms, uh, Amazon, Facebook, Google. In Facebook, it often tends to be will allow you, the dark pattern will, will allow you to protect your privacy, but you're going to have to go through a number of screens in order to get there. I think the Amazon example that you provided is a nice one. Um, really, th uh, these, are, these are what the report calls basically asymmetrically high transaction costs. Um, and in our view, the kind of work where we're trying to figure out what consumers would prefer in the abstract can help us inform things. Because if it turns out that if it's a, ch a choice that only 1% of consumers want to make or 2% of consumers want to make, then from our perspective, it's totally OK for Facebook to make you jump through four screens in order to get there. That makes a lot of business sense. If it's something that 80% of consumers would prefer, 80% of consumers would expect, then there's no good business rationale for making you jump through four different hoops or five different hoops in order to get there. OK. Well, thank you very much. I will continue the discussion in the next panel. Thank you.